Hello, this lecture is for Environmental Engineering 670, Hydrology and Drainage Control. Uh, today's lecture is for the 13th of February 2019. This is class number five of our semester. Before we get into today's topic of the hydrologic cycle and uh, the fundamentals of precipitation, I'll begin with an announcement that your next homework assignment, uh, assignment number five, that precipitation homework assignment is due on Wednesday, February 20th. So as per our usual schedule, please, please upload your PDF and uh, an Excel file for that homework assignment to MU Online before 4 p.m. on Wednesday, February 20th. All right, so uh, this lecture today is going over some of the fundamental science behind the hydrologic cycle and some of the factors that contribute to the formation of precipitation and the ways that it's measured. Uh, so if you have any questions after watching today's lecture, please feel free to stop by during my office. Uh, that goes likewise for the homework. If you need any help, please let me know and uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. What we've been talking about so far is ways to mitigate the effects of urbanization and the fact that um, as we increase the impervious area in a developed environment, it has the dual effect of speeding up the transit of uh, runoff over the surface of the land because the surface is more smooth if it's paved than it is when it's naturally vegetated. And then it's also decreasing the amount of infiltration, so increasing the fraction of the runoff of the rainfall that will move over the surface and goes to the outlet. So this is a nice figure from your text that kind of summarizes, broadly speaking, the two main categories of preventing um, excess rainwater from reaching an outlet. Uh, source control is where you're trying to upstream of a fair amount of concentration, deal with the water close to the, uh, close to the origin that the raindrop hit the ground. And so local disposal is preferred because it's trying to uh, reduce the runoff volume by decreasing the sea value of the surface. And so that may be amending soils to try and promote infiltration and percolation. And one of the ways to do that is the porous pavement that we saw the video on before. The next phase would be very similarly related, and that is inlet control, uh, where you're trying to not promote the natural absorption of water into the soil, but kind of an artificial absorption, even if it's just on a temporary basis. So a, a green roof that has the ability to temporarily store water or um, water vaults uh, like tanks underneath a parking area. So that's not as preferred as local disposal because it's just local storage. Disposal is actually eliminating the problem because it's infiltrating the water into the soil. Inlet control is slowing it down, but the water eventually will be discharged. Uh, so it's increasing the amounts, but it's still a great step in the right direction. So that may be just any sort of measure that detains, detains water temporarily. Finally, uh, on-site detention is uh, where the, the water has moved a little bit out of, out of uh, its initial impact location with the ground. And so it's concentrated. And any time you allow the water to concentrate, it's more difficult to control because the peaks can get larger, the volumes are higher, and uh, generally on uh, a cost basis, it's more expensive when you allow the water to concentrate. And it can cause erosion and scour. The systems are more prone to failure when you allow the water to concentrate. And so these engineered structures, just like a ditch or a, a pond, whether it's a, an extended aeration, I'm sorry, an extended uh, detention pond or uh, constructed wetlands. These are just things where uh, you have a relatively small contributing upst upstream area. Um, the distinguishing factor between source control and downstream storage is usually how much time it's spent in a pipe to get to where it's being stored. In the case of on-site detention, anything larger than maybe just a couple of hundred feet would be downstream storage. But if you're just collecting water from uh, catch basins and it's moving less than a few hundred feet to get to the pond, then that could still be considered a source control measure. And so the inline detention and offline detention is differentiated by if there's some sort of a control valve that has to be activated to reroute the water out of its normal flow path. Inline detention, we'll take a look at some pictures of 
it's essentially wide spots in the pipe where the water is just allowed to pool and by gravity flow it still continues on its original path whereas offline detention an example of that would be that Japanese case where they have uh, excavated really enormous underground vaults and they're having to use something like a jet engine to actually move the water from place to place now the the worst option uh, from a desirability standpoint and economic affordability is to store the water at a treatment plant uh, and it's better than allowing the rainwater to just wash through the treatment plant completely unregulated but um, it's very expensive and uh, the, the engineering costs are high the risk of failure uh, the I guess maybe the consequences of failure is more severe in the case of storing it at a treatment plant so here's just an illustration of the porous concrete where you can see that there is an open matrix of interconnected voids and if these voids weren't connected then the fact that the concrete is porous doesn't do any good so those voids have to be connected otherwise uh, it's going to get stuffy in here I just know it well I'm stumped I'll stop worrying about it <clears throat> Okay, you can see that um, the water just sort of drips through here and what's been emitted from this pavement um, from this uh, concrete mixture is that there's a very limited proportion of sand it's ordinarily it would be the sand that would get into those voids um, so if it's just the cement and then a fine um, a relatively small diameter gravel then uh, those voids will be interconnected here's an illustration of inlet control where they've put a storm drain underneath the parking lot and you can see that uh, the parking lot is sloped so that it flows by gravity into these uh, into these underground plastic containers and they'll just eventually you know there's not going to be any any infiltration necessarily from these although they could be perforated at the bottom most probably they're not um, simply because if they were perforated then uh, water could come in when the groundwater elevation is high so it's temporary storage inline detention um, this is going to be like an underground open channel that is, has a much larger area than it would need for just the typical flows and so it's kind of like overflow capacity during an enormous storm event and here's a picture of a flow equalization basin at a wastewater treatment plant um, where it has the ability of not only equilibrating the flow rate into the treatment plant but it also kind of evens out the variations in BOD possibly or it could be to the side of one you just have to think about um, you know where is the water being collected and so most probably you know the water that's getting into the inline detention would be coming from uh, storm drain inlets that are beside a roadway so it wouldn't necessarily have to be under the road but it would have to be close enough that whatever mainline pipe network is taking the storm water would go into here and uh, you know that vault filling up it's just kind of like an, an underground storage pond and they maybe have several of them so that it becomes a series of pools I just can't leave it alone it's starting to get hotter and hotter in here well it, it varies um, if it did just have a small outlet going out then uh, of course there's the possibility that the pond itself could overflow so they have to have they may have pipes at different elevations they have maybe a small one at the lowest elevation and then um, I uh -huh. uh huh it would just completely overwhelm it right. yeah I thought it was possible to unlock this by holding down the menu button but apparently that's not a thing let's see yeah there would be an it's similar to this situation where there's an inlet pipe and an outlet pipe okay. and uh, the outlet pipe is just going to be a smaller diameter than the inlet pipe and the outlet pipe would probably be at the bottom 
and then there would be a secondary outlet pipe higher up that's a larger diameter so that there is, it's not backing up here you know because if you only had a single outlet pipe and the water's coming in and it total overwhelms the capacity then it would just begin to flood here and so what you want to do is you want to delay it but by having I guess I'll draw a little sketch of it here on the board so here's the uh, the big pipe coming in and then you have a small pipe going out and uh, and then like a larger overflow pipe um, you, you're just sort of managing the uh, the consequences it's better to have the water exiting the overflow than flooding at a parking lot and so this would still go to the same stream that this is but at least you had uh, I mean by regulation there would be enough volume here to store let's say maybe the first inch of a storm and so you know the system did its job or as much of its job that it could in in Huntington the regulation is that it has to store an inch of rainfall before it's discharged yeah then you're not going to be able to store that inch yeah and the name for that is antecedent moisture condition that's the the fancy phrase to describe has it already been raining and we have to consider that in all sorts of situations like the soils capacity is affected by antecedent moisture condition as well and later in the semester we'll do computer simulations of how much water is coming out of uh, a watershed and we'll have to run it assuming it's been really dry uh, run it assuming like the standard it's been raining a little and then other conditions where there's been a series of successive storms day after day after day and essentially the soil is fully saturated and it's absorbing nothing so what normally like forest litter and even a nice sandy soil would normally have a great capacity to absorb and delay water it might as well be concrete if it's been raining for days and days pr prior to that yeah yeah before the big hurricane hits maybe things will dry out um, here are some pictures of flooding in West Virginia I guess I'll have some new ones that I can incorporate into the uh, presentation after next week there's no shortage if you Google flooding West Virginia there's plenty to choose from because you know it's such a hilly state that people naturally find it more cheaper to build their homes in the flat spots and inevitably what's flat is where the the screen the stream has scoured and so it's like the, the flood banks um, unless you're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars to do a bunch of earthwork and live up on a hill then you're uh, relegated to living next to a creek and so uh, this is obvious that hydrology is important in wet climates and um, here's a picture of uh, Richwood I, I really like Richwood it's a beautiful spot here's maybe the most uh, West Virginia video I've ever seen in my life um, all over yeah my family my parents live up in Ohio now I went to high school in Kansas City I lived in Utah and California and Maryland Dubai yeah I've been all over but I consider West Virginia home now so I, when I show videos like that it's not like I'm poking fun at, it's I consider myself a part of the rich culture of living in the hills all right uh, so uh, hydrology is also important in really arid regions and uh, there are consequences of flooding in dry environments that can be every bit as significant as flooding in wet environments this is a picture of a uh, open channel that discharges out of the mountains of the UAE straight into the sea and you can tell from the size of this person that this is a really big channel and they have huge floods that come out of those they call them wadis there instead of we have haulers here so a West Virginia hauler the equivalent of that in the UAE is a wadi it just basically means a watershed a small watershed um, here's a, uh, a a groundwater recharge reservoir in the mountains of Dubai and uh, they're very serious about their agricultural sector in the UAE they grow as much of their own produce as they're able to in the middle of the desert and so infiltrating groundwater whenever they have storms they try and capture as much of it as they can there's a lot of different dams this is one out in a wadi that's called Wadi Shauka that I went to several times throughout my time uh, there a couple of years ago and um, this 
dries up during the summer, but in the spring it's usually got water in it, and it's just to promote recharge of water down into the ground. Um, here's a picture of in an urban environment where uh, just things grew so quickly that they didn't really have time or the foresight to put in a stormwater network. And so similar to here in Huntington where there are spots where we wish we had a separate stormwater network in Sharjah, this is uh, one of the emirates near Dubai, they have a sanitary sewer, but in a lot of parts of the city, they don't have a separate drainage network. And so when it rains, uh, parking areas just get completely submerged. And that's a Mercedes there. So that breaks my heart to see a nice car like that underwater. And it still has plastic on the seats, right? So they are trying to keep it nice, but then they parked it in a flood-prone area. So I think that car is probably ruined. Um, just some more pictures. I took these uh, on a rainy day. I was driving around, and the cabs were like boats. And people who aren't used to rainy weather were finding whatever way they could to put on a plastic bag and keep dry. Um, in the spots where they don't have um, stormwater collection networks in the UAE, what they do is they send out pumper trucks that are similar to what you'd uh, vacuum out a septic tank with. And so, you know, there are tanks, there are trucks like this in uh, here in West Virginia, but they're just used for people's individual septic net networks. There, they have hundreds of these trucks uh, vacuuming water out of underpasses, and then they drive out into the desert and they discharge the water that they've sucked out from a low spot in the road. And it's really dangerous. Visibility is poor at night in a rainstorm. Yeah, the roads are slippery. The dr drivers are exhausted, and so inevitably, after a rainstorm, you'd see crashed up tanker trucks that have been used to uh, pump storm water. And uh, standing water will stay beside the road for days and days after a major storm, which has mosquito breeding risks, is a risk for drivers. You know, if you're at night and you don't necessarily notice that puddle, it can cause you to steer into the into the puddle, and so. You know, stormwater collection and movement is a real problem, and uh, it can make surfaces very slippery. This is the campus that I was teaching at. That's um, polished granite. Um, rather than having like concrete or grass, you don't have to water granite. So they've got a lot of the granite out, but it, gets, it sure gets slippery when it rains. Yeah, it, it's the sort of thing where. It'll rain maybe two or three days a year. And so you think, oh, I'm not going to put in a whole pipe network to make it less flooded two days a year. But then those two days, yeah. And in fact, uh, my, my son broke his arm on one of those days. And it was really hard to get to the hospital because all the roads were flooded. Well, fortunately, there was just a brand new hospital that had opened up near campus. And so I was able to, to get him to that one. If we'd had to drive into downtown, you know, like I would have had to set the bone, basically. It was, there's no way to get down there because you need a boat through some of the intersections. It's really bad. So, you know, well, it, it, you sure don't get a lot of infiltration into the ground with, uh, with granite, right? I mean, that's, that's a sea value way higher than the sea value of concrete or asphalt because that's so well polished. It just doesn't retain any, on the surface any water. There's no surface wetting requirement before sheet flow begins with polished granite. Um, and you know, they, it's not like they've got clay soils. Here, we've got clay soils. And we'll look at infiltration tables based on soil properties. And part of the reason we have flooding in West Virginia, besides it's so hilly, uh, is the fact that we've got really poor soils. Um, over there, they've got sandy soils, which should be great for infiltration, but it's just um, the rain comes quickly. It's a very intense rainstorm when it does hit. So I wanted to emphasize and refresh your memory kind of the relationship between hydrology and hydraulic engineering. And remember that the hydrologist is the person who tells uh, what is the cue, like what's the peak runoff from a watershed. And the hydraulic engineer is the one who sizes the pipe or the channel to handle the flow. Hydrology broadly is broken up into two different disciplines. There is surface hydrology, which is the, the large part of what we're going to be studying this semester. We'll only spend maybe one or two class lectures at the end of the semester on subsurface hydrology, which is focusing on the movement of water in the subsurface. 
Uh, of course, hydraulic engineering can be classified into pipe flow, which is less to do with hydrology. Pipe flow is mo mostly like pressurized water distribution pipes, but open channel flow is the division of hydraulic engineering that is uh, more salient to the hydrology, you know, trying to uh, accommodate the movement of water in rivers and canals, basically responding to the cue that has been specified by the hydrologist and finding some place to put the water. Um, there's a lot of really nice diagrams that summarize the water cycle. Man, it's getting cool again. It's just really yo-yoing and it's, the panel's still locked, so I don't know what's going on. All right, this is a good one because uh, it shows the different spots that the water can be delayed in the water cycle, but the oceans is ultimately where all of the water comes from. And I'll point out that here the sun, being in this picture, is a key point of the hydrologic cycle. That what drives that movement of water through the earth is uh, sunshine. And the radiation heats up the water in the oceans and allows it to evaporate. And it's movement of the moisture through the atmosphere and ultimately the precipitation onto the surface that causes things like uh, glaciers, which is a permanent accumulation of snow. And the way that the glacier terminates is either that the gravity is driving the ice downhill until it gets to an elevation where it melts, or sometimes glaciers in, uh, come straight to the edge of the ocean, and then there will be the calving and the breaking off of ice back into the ocean. Um, there's the runoff and infiltration into the soil, a small fraction of the water cycle is the movement of water underground and it'll eventually either spring to the surface and then the rest of the way it will be surface flow or there is actually groundwater flow where there's a net movement of water back into the ocean from uh, the subsurface. And of course there's evaporation from the land areas, it's not just evaporation from the oceans. Uh, the next slide I'm going to show you kind of breaks it down by relative quantities to give you an idea of how important these different processes are on an amount basis. And so this is a figure that shows if we say on a, on, if there's 100 units of precipitation onto the land, then what that means is to get that 100 units of precipitation, so we can think of it as a percentage, there has to be 424 units of evaporation from the ocean. And that relative amount is related mostly to the fraction of the Earth's surface that is covered by water versus how much of it is covered by land. Because most of the precipitation that occurs on average over the surface of the Earth is going to fall right back into the oceans. And so then that doesn't really have any effect on the movement of water over the land. Um, but you see, when there's precipitation onto the land, uh, some of it will infiltrate, and the amount that infiltrates is relatively smaller than the amount that's running over the surface. Uh, if, if we think about 100 units of precipitation onto the land, so a key indicator that most of that ends up as surface runoff is the fact that 61 units is going to evaporate from the land. And so it can only evaporate from the land if it's close to the surface. Uh, the, the water that's down in the subsurface only has the uh, potential to evaporate if it's being, being taken up by plant roots or if it's being pumped up uh, through groundwater wells. And so a small fraction of it, the groundwater flow gets back into the ocean directly, but the net difference between evaporation and the precipitation that occurred earlier is that the surface outflow and you'll see in the picture here that this illustration differentiates between like natural reservoirs and engineered structures. And um, there's also this shaded area that's an impervious strata. And so that would be like a thick clay layer or rock that is unbroken and is confining the water so that there can be like a, a perched um, aquifer where the water table here is, you know, the water would continue downward, but the water is stuck by that confining layer. And so as the infiltration goes down into the soil, you can see it's elevated on one side compared to the other. And that 
causes a sideways movement of the moisture through the soil. And so that's what causes um, this base flow to get into streams and lakes. And so the, the movement of water into a lake from the ground is usually because of an underlying impervious layer. We'll get more into a lot of that. We have a whole section of the course that has to do with infiltration. But I think this is an interesting diagram just to kind of see the, the amounts and where water is moving. And if we break the amount of water in the earth up into where it is and how usable is it, it kind of highlights um, how fortunate we are here in this area to have easy access to the Ohio River because uh, most of the Earth's surface is not very close to a ready supply of fresh water because if we look at all of the water on the planet, 96% uh, of that is in the oceans. And we can use ocean water but it's very costly to do so. Um, the cost of desalination, if you are using the best available technology and the cheapest electricity that you can find on a, on a reasonable basis, we're talking about including all the subsidies that go into elect electricity, a cubic meter of water costs on the order of about 50 cents to produce. And that doesn't seem like a lot. Like if you're accustomed to going into uh, a gas station and paying $1.19 for a 20 ounce bottle of Dasani and you think, wow, 50 cents for a cubic meter, that's a great bargain. But actually 50 cents per cubic meter is really expensive if you're trying to do things like raise rice or raise wheat or cotton or any of those crops. They have a huge amount of embodied water demand. So ocean water is uh, it's tough to use. It's really expensive. So only a small fraction of the uh, of the Earth's water is fresh. And of that that is fresh, most of it is not usable because it's either tied up at the polar ice caps or it's, uh, it's bound in glaciers. And so, unfortunately, most of the glaciers have started to recede and more of that stored fresh water is ending up into the oceans. Um, some of the groundwater can be used you know, we can put wells underground and pump out the groundwater, but unfortunately, a lot of this groundwater is so deep that it's not economical to retrieve it. Um, to be economical to retrieve, groundwater has to be within just a, a couple hundred meters of the surface. You know, anything much deeper than that, then the electrical cost of lifting it up so high is going to make it more expensive than you can actually use. You know, the, the value of the crop you're trying to grow maybe is outweighed by the electrical costs of bringing the water to the surface. And so only a small fraction of that groundwater is usable. But the surface water that we're so fortunate to have, if you think about the, uh, the surface water, it's only 1.3% of 2.5%. And that's what we've got just 200 yards to our north in the Ohio River. Um, and of that surface water that's only 1.3% of 2.5%, a lot of that is ice and snow. Uh, so we're talking about maybe not necessarily glaciers, but snow that's covering the northern Alaska, Greenland, um, Antarctic snow that isn't necessarily packed into a glacier ice. And so the point is, is that uh, there's a very small fraction of the Earth's water that is fresh, and all we have to do is you know, add some coagulant and settle out the colloids, and it's ready to drink, like we have in the Ohio River. So it's, it kind of emphasizes what a pity it is when we use rivers as just a place to dump waste, because um, you know, it's, it's, it's such a rare thing that we need to really preserve that resource to higher purposes than as a waste repository. Okay, uh, we've talked about wadis today and haulers. Um, in the textbook, I don't think you'll find the phrase hauler any place, but um, sometimes it'll refer to it as a drainage basin or a catchment or a watershed. And here you can see that they've drawn a dashed line along the, uh, the ridge line of this drainage basin. And just to illustrate, um, I want to show you a, uh, on Google Earth Pro, it has a nice feature where you can kind of pivot around um, areas that have had elevation 
areas that have had their elevation defined, like um, it can drape the image over an elevation data. It's called the digital elevation map, a DEM. So let's zoom in on the area here. Uh, I need to turn that off, though. All right, so here we are in Cabell County. Let's go out by the high school, Cabell Midland. How many people here went to Cabell Midland? Just one? Oh, well, I thought there'd be more than that. All right, so out here, not far from the mall, out in the general vicinity of Cabell Midland. So in Google Earth, one of the nice things is it allows you to pivot. And so what we're doing is now we're changing our point of view. Let me dim the lights even further so you can see that a little bit better. Okay, so as I pivot down, you can start to see that the terrain is turned on. Um, through aerial pho photographs, they've determined the elevation of every spot on the surface, and they kind of drape the image. And what makes it most visible is when you start to pan, you can see where the ridge lines are. And so you can see here is a ridge line, right? And as we pan around sideways. And so if it rains in that bowl, it's kind of like a basin. If it rains in that basin, then the water is going to concentrate at the bottom of that basin. And so that's where the stream is going to form. I, I mean, it never occurred to me when I was first learning about hydrology, I, I think, like, why is a river in a certain spot? That's because that's the lowest spot. I mean, I, it took me a while to figure that out. but. I'm just giving you that gem right off the bat. Uh, the rivers form in the low points. <laughs> okay. And so as we pan around and look at the terrain, uh, later on what I'll ask you to do in a different assignment is to uh, manually kind of sketch out, like draw a polygon and uh, delineate a watershed. That phrase delineate means to find the boundary so that on one side of the hill the water is going to flow outside. Like if, if we were going to put in a bridge right here, because we know water is going to be flowing through this, uh, through this low point. If we need a bridge for some reason, you know, if the person on this side of the property wants to go to that property, a little footbridge, we have to figure out, well, what's the water level going to be for a certain size storm? Well. Q equals CIA, you're not always just given the A. Sometimes you have to identify the area by looking at the uh, elevation data, whether it's on a topographic map or just even an aerial photo, and sketching out uh, a polygon and uh, you know, just saying, well, here's the top of the ridge line, roughly, and all the spots inclusive that are going to be contributing to that. And then I think it'll give you in the measurements here the area in terms of acres. And so about 40 acres. And so now we know the area of the contributing area upstream of some watershed. And there's more automated, sophisticated ways to do that. We're going to use a program this semester called WMS that will just it'll slice up this watershed and automatically look at the slope of every cell and it'll do that delineation for you. But when it does, it's essentially just trying to analyze the catchment in the same way that we just did visually. Where does a watershed end? Um, another, like thinking back to my, uh, my first exposure to hydrology, one of the things, the concepts that didn't make a lot of sense to me is the instructor would say, you know, here is the outlet of the watershed. He'd use the word outlet. And what that means is just a certain spot that all of the water is flowing to. And there's an infinite number of outlets in a watershed. Like, I can pick any point inside of this basin and say, here's the outlet. You know, I could say the outlet is here. And 
the place that you say is the outlet of the watershed is essentially where you're interested in knowing what is the flow at that location. So if I had a road that was crossing the stream, then what I'd say is the watershed I care about is whatever is contributing to the stream up, up, uh, upstream of that location. So the area that is, is contributing upstream of that location. So any place there's a crossing or potential for flooding, that defines where the outlet is and where the watershed ends. So this next nested hierarchy illustration makes the point that within one big watershed is a lot of smaller contributing watersheds. And you can break it up into pieces. And the amount of runoff that you're going to see is in large part related to the area upstream contributing land area. Also, what's on that land? So if you have uh, urbanized area, that's going to lend itself to a lot more runoff than uh, natural land that's got uh, you know, like organic material that can slow down the movement of the water. Soil type contributes to the runoff quantity because as I've mentioned earlier today, sandy soils are a lot better at infiltrating water than clay soils because they have larger voids and the water can move through those voids uh, a lot more rapidly than it can move through the small pore sizes of a clay soil. The terrain conditions also contribute to runoff because remember that when we looked at the value of uh, the table of sea values that the slope of the land um, is going to have an effect of how quickly the water can move over the surface and how much of it infiltrates. And here in West Virginia, since it's so hilly, with some of the watersheds being more than 50% slope, then that just uh, lends itself to what's often described as flashy behavior, meaning that the water concentrates really quickly. And of course, rainfall is a key point as well. So just think in terms of Q equals CIA. And so I is talking about the rainfall. C is talking about the surface characteristics, and A is the size of the watershed. So we're going to focus in the next couple of lectures a lot on the rainfall component of identifying runoff. Now, rainfall is uh, closely related to the movement of air, because if there's evaporation uh, at the ocean, that moisture has to be moved over the land or else there isn't going to be any precipitation. And so you have to have transport of the moisture from where the evaporation occurs to your point of interest. And so the movement of air. Um, the movement of air across the Earth's surface depends on temperature differences at different latitudes and altitudes inside of the atmosphere. And because of the temperature differences, there's going to be pressure differences in the atmosphere. And the movement of a low pressure system and a high pressure system is what can move the water vapor from spot to spot and also the rotation of the Earth. So first of all, this Hadley circulation diagram shows the difference in temperatures and pressures. And what we know is at the poles, the temperatures are cool. And at the equator, the temperatures are warm. And so what that causes to happen is if there's warm air, it rises. And so at the pole, the general trend is if you look here on the sides, you can, you can see uh, the air is rising at the pole, and then it's going towards the uh, location of um, cooler air, because at, at the poles, there is a downdraft. And so it's falling at the poles and rising at the equator, and that causes there to be like a loop that's forming. It's kind of like a conveyor belt. And that takes the moisture along with it where you've got warm air that's a lot of evaporation at the equators, and that's driving moisture from the center of the Earth towards the poles. And so then if you, if you think in three dimensions over the surface, it's not just a single belt that's going from the pole, uh, uh, from the equator towards the pole, but it's like an entire sheet that's moving downward towards the equator, and then in the upper atmosphere, it's going back to, the, uh, back to the poles. And so if you combine that with the rotation of the Earth, now this kind of is an illustration that demonstrates on a, uh, on a rotating circle, if you drop a 
marble, as it goes down, the path that it traces isn't just a straight line as the plate continues to, uh, continues to rotate. And so the plate is rotating, the marble is dropped, so it's kind of like a, a curved trend. And um, that's what accounts for when you have that rotation of the Earth along with the Hadley circulation, both of them at the same time. That's why here in the Northern Hemisphere, in the United States, we see wind generally is going from the west towards the east. You know, if we want to know what the weather is going to be, we usually look at Kentucky here. But people in other latitudes don't look to their west to find out what the weather is going to be. Uh, down in Central America, for instance, they look to the east to find out what the weather is going to be. And the reason for that is it's the combination of the Coriolis uh, forces and uh, the polar high pressures. And so there's these uh, more localized like belt routes of the trade winds and where it's usually warming in certain spots, cooling in others, and uh, especially as the Earth is tilting throughout the seasons, these trade winds have seasonal effects as well. During uh, the days that people would move through the oceans in sailing ships, they could only make journeys during certain seasons because these, these trade winds would set up only during certain periods of the year, and so there would be a route of when they would go to China, <clears throat> when they would return from China. It was all having to do with the, the general um, <clears throat> wind directions. Excuse me. And so here's an, another figure that illustrates the typical patterns of where the water, uh, where the air is moving, and the water that's absorbed in the air along with it. <clears throat> uh, this figure illustrates that when water is um, evaporating from one location, the precipitation that happens after that evaporation is really widespread. Um, and uh, this is just an illustration like if there's evaporation in Vietnam, the water that uh, falls onto the surface from that evaporation in Vietnam may be making its all, all its way uh, to South Carolina. Um, uh, this is maybe another reminder of why things like acid rain and uh, the movement of radioactive pollution from Japan after they had that Fukushima incident, uh, why you know, pollution isn't just a local phenomenon, why it has the potential to cause problems all over the world is because um, the, uh, the water cycle really is a global phenomenon. So the rain that falls here in West Virginia, especially in the case of a hurricane, that, that water may have evaporated somewhere in Africa before it finally makes its way to us. All right, this is the important stuff now. All this has just been kind of setting the groundwork for uh, understanding the mechanics of what causes precipitation. There's three main forces that cause precipitation, um, and we're going to talk about all of them but they have some things in common. And those three main forces that cause precipitation are all different effects that cause air to cool. And the reason why cooling air lends itself to precipitation is that think about you know, the, the moisture that's precipitation, where it came from was evaporation. And so there's humidity in the air. And for us to have rain, that humidity has to come out of the air. Like when we look up and we see clouds in the sky, that's just air. And what we're seeing is condensation of droplets onto some sort of a nucleus. That's like the visual representation that the cloud is. is it's a droplet, like a mist. And so for that water to come out of the air, it has to cool to the point of it begins to um, be completely saturated. Uh, if you look in the book, it describes the dew point temperature. And um, dew is something that happens usually like in the summer or even in the winter. You can find frost on your grass in the morning. Um, you notice dew mostly in the morning because at night, as the air cools, what happens is the percent saturation increases. It's the same amount of water. Like if we had a cubic meter of air, so we've got one meter of air. Maybe there's uh, 10 grams of water 
in that cubic meter of air. And at night, what happens is that mass of air is cooling down, but the solubility of water in air decreases as air cools. It's like chemicals. You probably know, for example, that if you want to dissolve salt into water, it's easy to dissolve salt in boiling water than it is to dissolve salt in cold water. Like, uh, you can get more of it to dissolve in hot water. Not only does it dissolve more quickly, but the absolute solubility of most chemicals increases with temperature. There's only a few chemicals that become less soluble with increasing temperature. Air is the same way. That warm air can hold more moisture than cool air can. And so when air cools, the, what happens is the relative humidity increases until the air is fully saturated, until it's holding as much water as it can, and all the extra air has to go someplace. And so uh, a, a glass of ice water. Why does a glass of ice water sweat on the outside? It's not like the water is making its way through the glass. Uh, the sweat on a cool glass of water is actually, it's the moisture in the surrounding air coming out of solution from the air and it's absorbing onto the surface of the glass because the glass is cold. So what happens is that cold glass is cooling down the air that's adjacent to the glass and then it's the moisture in the air that's precipitating and making that glass kind of sweat. So the same thing happens in the atmosphere. Um, there are some minor effects that cause the air to cool and so it may be that uh, heat is just radiating um, it could be that uh, air, air of different temperatures is mixing or there's conduction of the heat. Uh, the movement horizontally through this, um, like if, air, if wind is blowing air from a spot where the, um, the pressure is high towards a low pressure region and the low pressure region has a different uh, temperature, then that could cause it to cool off. But the main thing that causes air to cool, the most significant phenomena is uh, lifting it up in the atmosphere. So uplift, all three of the things that we talk about, the different types of rainfall, they all have to do with air being lifted, and then when it lifts, it cools, and then when it cools, the relative humidity increases until the air is fully saturated with moisture. As much moisture is dissolved in the air as it can, and all of the other moisture that's still around has to uh, precipitate onto something in the same way that there's a chemical precipitation reaction which means something that was dissolved turns into a solid uh, the precipitation reaction that has to do with rainfall is that dissolved moisture is uh, is coming out of solution and it's a liquid because it's above freezing and it has to absorb onto something and that thing that it absorbs onto is some sort of a nucleus it could be dust that's in the atmosphere it may even just be salt particles from the ocean. Um, waves that are crashing onto the shore or in, in the middle of the ocean when there are waves crashing into each other, it sends salt spray up into the atmosphere. And those really small particles of sodium chloride can be enough of a nucleation site for water droplets begin to uh, form on some sort of a nucleus, any kind of dust. And so, uh, in over back to talking about the UAE, one of the things that they've started doing in the United Arab Emirates is providing more nucleation sites so that they want to, they want to encourage more rainfall. They don't get enough. But it's really humid over there. You think a desert isn't humid. You're wrong. Uh, it's close to the Gulf and it's oppressively humid there. So they knew, well, we've got a lot of warm, moist air, but one of the limiting factors sometimes is there weren't enough nucleation sites. So they fly around and they spray silver particles into the atmosphere. And those silver particles, I'm not sure why silver, but that's what frequently is, is used is a, a really fine grain of silver. And then the, uh, the water can condense onto that. Uh, the droplets begin to grow as they collide with each other. And also as the air continues to cool, then the water has to go somewhere. It can't, be, it can't stay as a gas anymore because the, the relative humidity is 100%. You can't have more than saturation. You've dissolved as much water in the atmosphere as you can, and so it's having to continue to grow, and the droplets are getting larger and larger until uh, the forces that keep them suspended 
can't uh, handle the weight of the droplet and it falls downward. And so the water vapor continues to make the, the droplets larger and then gravity overcomes their suspended um, forces and they fall to the earth. And so all precipitation follows the same process regardless of what causes the lifting. There are different forces that cause the lifting, but it's always uh, lifting that cools it and increases the humidity so that there's precipitation. Any questions about that process? You'll need to be able to describe it. 100% of the semesters I give some sort of a question either on a quiz or an exam asking students to explain what causes rainfall. And what I, when I'm asking what causes rainfall, I want, like from the beginning, you've got a puddle of water. How does it go from a puddle of water to rainfall? That whole thing from evaporation to lifting to condensation onto a nucleation site and so on. So be able to use all of these words in a cohesive uh, description. But hold on a second. Why does air cool as it rises? Like I said, it's always about air getting lifted. Why does air cool off as it goes up through the atmosphere? Okay. It's because in the upper atmosphere, there's less pressure. Uh, remember when we talked about in uh, fluid mechanics, uh, as you go down, the hydrostatic equation says that as you go down through a fluid, the pressure increases. So delta P is uh, delta H times gamma. And the same thing applies not just to liquids, but also to gases. As you go up through the atmosphere, you know, anytime you go up, the pressure is decreasing. As you go down, the pressure is increasing. So here we are pretty close to sea level. Here the pressure is about 100 kilopascals. So as we go up, the pressure is decreasing. And if you think about a balloon, the forces that are acting on a balloon at uh, sea level, here's our balloon, there's pressure that's acting from outside of the balloon to keep it a certain size. But then if you let go of the balloon and it drifts up high, there's not going to be as much pressure pushing on it at that higher elevation. Because of the hydrostatic equation, the pressure is lower, and so the volume is bigger. The balloon expands. Inside the balloon is the same mass of air, but now it's occupying more space. And as it expands, it cools off. And so we call that the adiabatic lapse rate. And uh, the dry adiabatic lapse rate is that if you go 1,000 meters into the sky, then it's going to decrease in temperature by 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's approximately. And it's a linear relationship through most of the altitude that clouds are formed that we're interested in. And so since the air is being forced to rise, the, uh, it's expanding and it's cooling because it's expanding. Um, and then as it cools, the solubility decreases, and so the moisture has to go somewhere, and it goes on to the uh, nucleation sites. And so the three main things that causes air to rise is convergence of storm fronts, orography, which means wind flowing over an obstacle, and convection which is lifting that's due to heating. So we'll talk about each of those three different causes of uplift. Uh, the most complicated of the three is convergence, where you've got storms coming together. So um, remember that when the air is dry, the temperature decrease is about 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Um, if the air has fully saturated with moisture, then the temperature decrease isn't as big. Um, just because some of the temperature change is buffered by the moisture that's in there if it's fully saturated. So depending on how dry the air is in the atmosphere, that affects the temperature change that you'll see as you go up through the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, good question. So hot air rises, 
So why is it that it's getting cooler as it rises? So you need to think like cause and effect. Um, here, it's not rising because it's cooling. It's cooling because it's rising. So something else is causing it to go up. Um, it's not, and, and um, air can go up for other reasons than being heated. You're right that heated air will rise. And in fact, that's what causes convection. So we will talk about the effect of warm air rises. So that does tie into it. But there are other things that could cause air to rise as well. So it's confusing. The thing to, uh, to think of is that it, air cooling off is not the cause of its rise. It's the effect of it having risen. Yeah. All right. So here is a top view. Back in the olden days, when they didn't have like nice weather satellites. If you look like a, we a TV weather report from the 50s, it would be a bunch of diagrams like this, where people kind of would keep track of where's the uh, high pressure front, where's the uh, low pressure front, and how are the two masses of air moving together. Because they didn't really have radar or satellites that could depict that, then what they would do is they would measure temperatures and atmospheric pressures in different cities and then they'd like interpolate. They'd know where is there a cold front and a warm front. So let's just say this line AB, we're going to take a, a cross-sectional view. And what it is is we have some warm air that's mixing together with cold air. And so eventually, it's the mixture of the warm air and the cold air that's going to cause um, the warm, moist air to be lifted. And so now this is the side view. So what we're looking at on the left side of this diagram is the cold air is encroaching on the warm air. It's kind of like closing in, like a noose. So that cold air is approaching the warm air. And so here we've got this warm, moist air that is being forced to lift in front of the cold front. And the reason why it's forced to lift is because warm air rises, cold air is more dense, and so you've got this mass of cold air approaching that's more dense than the surrounding air that's in the vicinity of a certain location. And so it's going to ab abruptly rise in the face of that cold front, and that causes a thunderstorm. So this is convergence. You've got a convergence of two different fronts. Sometimes convergence is called frontal lifting, because you've got the cold front encroaching on warm air and forcing it to rise. At the same time, that the cold air is kind of forcing some of the air to immediately rise. It's also moving the warm air. It's kind of pushing some of it. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, pushing on a noodle. You know, Some of it's going to move on ahead, and some of it's going to go up over. So some of it's going up over the immediately encroaching cold front, but some of it is gradually rising up on top of the other part of the warm front. I'm sorry, the, the cold front that is the warm air is being pushed towards. And so there's a more gradual lifting. And so that would be kind of like a drizzle, light rain, because it's not being forced to rise as quickly. The precipitation isn't as intense. So when you have a really intense rainstorm, that can be indicative that the air was caused to rise quickly. If it's just a slow, day-long drizzle, like they see in Seattle, where it just rains all day, but it's not ever running, raining very hard, that may mean that the rain was lifting more slowly. Okay, So that's convergence. And the book has some important descriptions of each of these three phenomena. I'd encourage you to follow along in the textbook and read more about the forces that causes rainfall. And I'll draw your attention to the difference between abrupt rise in air causes a thunderstorm with a lot of energy and high intensity, but then the light, long duration precipitation is where the warm air is naturally, in a slow way, gradually rising up on top of the cool air, rather than being forced by the encroaching warm front, the encroaching cold front. So you have to look at which is approaching which. Is the warm air approaching the cool air, in which case it would be more gradual rainfall, or is the cool air approaching the warm air? So. Um, that was convergence. This is an illustration of orography. And this is Hawaii, I think. 
Hawaii. Yeah. Has anybody been to Hawaii here? All right. Did you go to Oahu? Do you remember hearing people talk about the windward side and the leeward side? Yeah. All right. Yeah, the, the, the windward side is nicer than the leeward side because the windward side is green. But check out on the other side of the mountain, on the leeward side, it's almost like a desert. So what do you suppose is going on in this picture? Good. That's exactly right. So why is this side not getting moisture, but this side was? I mean, this is a thin peninsula. I mean, it can maybe only uh, I don't know, 10 miles or something. You're not that far from the ocean on either side. It's just not the top view that will tell you the story. If we looked at the side view, here's the, here's the mountain. And so what's happening is that the wind is blowing in a certain direction, usually, you know, because of the, the typical windfall patterns. What we see is that there's a, a typical direction for the wind to be blowing. And as you've got warm, moist air, it's being lifted because it has to go over that physical obstacle of the mountain. And as it's lifted, the air is cooling. As the air is cooling, the relative humidity is increasing until the air is fully saturated, and then when the air is completely saturated with moisture, uh, it continues to lift even higher, and now there's too much water. And so it's got to go somewhere. The excess leftover moisture has to precipitate onto some dust, some salt particles, whatever it is that's around for it to precipitate onto, maybe other water droplets. And so it continues to um, get oversaturated, so then there's the point of like precipitation, uh, and so it relieves the, the cloud, and then as the air begins to drop again, the relative humidity decreases. And so that's why this looks like a desert, is because the moisture that this land is in contact with, that the air is uh, relatively dry, because it's at a lower elevation, it's not saturated, all of the excess water has been discharged on the mountain. So here is actually a map of um, Oahu that shows the windward side, which is on the uh, east, and the leeward side, which is on the west. And if you ever want to find a cheap place to stay, <laughs> then find an apartment over on the leeward side. There are some great values. And I mean, there's still some nice beaches over there. It, it's just not as lush and green. You know, the flowers, and you don't smell the... Uh, yeah, it's not so bad. Yeah, that's true. Um, we were staying in Kailua, which is a real nice place over here on the windward side by a Marine Corps base. If you drive all the way around Oahu uh, to get over to the leeward side, it's maybe an hour and a half, so it's not so bad. All right, so... That's orography, physical obstacles causing the water to lift. And that's another thing that in the UAE they've thought, maybe we can use orography. They've actually proposed building enormous towers to force the wind to go over those towers, and knowing that if the wind has to go over those obstacles, then the relative humidity will increase, and so maybe that would be another way to encourage precipitation. They haven't done that yet. They have done cloud seeding, but they haven't built their own mountains to force rainfall. OK, finally, the third of the big three is convective lifting. And this is the phenomenon where uh, during the day, the surface gets warm. And so because of the solar radiation, um, it's heating the surface, and then the air begins to rise. And as the heated air is rising, it takes moisture with it and then it, it starts getting an upward movement, so it's not continuing to be heated. It was heated at the surface, because the surface is where the radiation occurs. That's where the sun is, like the, the thing that was warmed up was the ground. It's like you're standing next to a brick wall after a long day, you can feel that radiation. It's not the air that's warm, it's, it's the wall or the ground. And so 
as it's rising, um, it's beginning to lose it that heated, the temperature is decreasing because the air is expanding and it's no longer close to the surface that's warm. And so um, you can see what almost looks like a mushroom cloud in the summer, these afternoon thunderstorms in the Midwest. It's why my dad refuses to fly through Chicago. It's because he's been stuck there so many times from the afternoon thunderstorms. Like about 3 p.m. after the surface of the land has been heated up all day long, there will be these storms in the Midwest that uh, can be really intense because you know if it's a super hot day then there's a lot of air that's being lifted up. So convective lifting, um, essentially what you're having, this diagram is just kind of illustrating the uh, adiabatic lapse rate of um, air cooling as it lifts and there's a point at which uh, condensation occurs and that's where the air has now cooled to the dew point of the surrounding, um, the surrounding air. And so you can do a graph of the relationship between relative humidity and temperature and another graph that is the air cooling with elevation and find the point of intersection. But on a more qualitative basis, what you need to just remember is that the sun heats the surface, the air rises, it cools, and then it precipitates for all the same reasons that we've talked about before. So the, uh, regardless of whether it is uh, snow, hail, sleet, rain, all of these processes have the same basic structure where there has to be some sort of a condensation nuclei and it, it can be really small and then the moisture coalesces around those droplets which combine. Initially, the small droplets have a, a negative charge in the same way that you probably remember in your discussions of clay, that clay particles have a negative charge. Actually, most particles uh, will repel each other while they're small because the repulsive force outweighs any sort of mass that they have behind them. They're moving around, but they can't really bump into each other because the electrostatic repulsive force is greater than the momentum that they have because the particles are so small. So it's not until those particles have a little bit of moisture accumulated to the surface that they would have enough momentum to actually achieve a collision and the droplets will begin to form and then uh, finally the precipitation occurs. So that's kind of the, the, the fundamentals of what causes rainfall. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how rainfall is measured. And uh, here in the area, this is a figure that shows where are some of the rain gauging stations. And so here we've got uh, Huntington, here's Charleston, just to give you an idea of the scale. And usually the best uh, rain data we can get is at an airport. And so you can see here's the uh, Jaeger Airport, here's Huntington Tri-State. Both of them have uh, a symbol for precipitation data is being gathered there. Uh, there's one down here at East Lynn another one at uh, Beach Fork. Oh, maybe, maybe this is the one near Beach Fork. Um, some of these are operated just by individuals who are like weather enthusiasts. It may be as simple as someone is on a once a day basis going out and looking at uh, uh, a pan and seeing how much the water level in the pan has changed. Um, in other cases, it's a more sophisticated like tipping bucket that over time can tell you the intensity of the rainfall in maybe like 15 minute intervals. The thing is, is there's not that much data that's been collected for a long time. This figure illustrates for across the country the number of stations and how long they've been operating. So if you look at, it's only been in about the last 140 years that people have been consistently measuring and keeping the data for rain gauges, there's only about seven rain gauges that we have 140 years of data for. Um, but if we look at 50 years, how many gauges do we have with 50 years of data? It looks like around 700 across the entire country. And so, you know, that 700 seems like a lot, but it's a very large country. And so sometimes uh, the data, if you're interested in a certain location, there can be very limited actual physical data. So there are a lot of statistical techniques that we have to go through to try and interpolate 
uh, where we actually have measured rainfall data and a project that we're interested in. <clears throat> Remember that a hydrograph is a plot of rainfall depth or intensity over time. And so in this case, every hour, the rainfall intensity was graphed during a certain storm. It kind of helps you to visualize how intense the rain was and when it occurred. Um, rainfall can also be graphed on a cumulative basis where the slope of the line indicates a uh, more intense storm. And you can see both the absolute a quantity of rainfall that occurred during a certain storm, but also by how steep it is, what the intensity was at a certain duration. And they've staggered these storms just so that the lines aren't on top of each other to kind of spread out the data. You've already seen intensity, duration, frequency curves, or at least you've seen a representation of one of the curves uh, on some of the examples and on the homework that you did related to time of concentration. Um, <clears throat> often these curves are expressed in terms of intensity. Sometimes they're expressed in terms of depth. And so if they're expressed in terms of depth, then the characteristic shape uh, is more tapering downward rather than tapering uh, with the shape that's shown there. Uh, so here it's intensity and this one is inches per hour and it's expressed logarithmically because if it's not expressed logarithmically then um, you tend not to be able to show the really rare hundred year storm intensities on the same figure as a storm that has a return period of only two years and if we're going out to the duration of the storm, you can see that the intensity is as low as a tenth of an inch per hour. So the only way to display all that was with the logarithmic scale. So IDF stands for intensity, duration, frequency. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to find the depth of a certain storm, what you would do is you would multiply the intensity by the duration. So a storm that is a two-year return period just means that in any given year, there's a 50% chance that you'd see that storm. But in any given year, there's also a 20% chance of having a five-year storm. So these probabilities are, in a sense, cumulative, that um, just because you had a two-year storm doesn't mean you're not going to have another one in the same year. And it also, you're, you're exposed to the risk of all of these storms in any given year. But if we wanted to find that the depth that occurred during a storm that has a duration of one hour, what we could do is we could go up to the two year and then follow it over. That's 0.9 inches per hour. So 0.9 inches per hour for one hour would mean that the overall depth was 0.9. So just be aware of when we go to a website that shows these IDF curves, you can click on a map it will generate it either in terms of intensity or in terms of depth. Yeah? Is there a way to plot those grids in the cell? I know you can do logarithmic axes, but I don't mm -hmm. know if you can take the cell line and show the cell line. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, if we have some time at the end of class, let's go through and do that because we are going to be creating, uh, doing IDF calculations, but I've never graphed it as part of the example before. but. If we've got the time, let's give it a shot. All right, so how, where does this data come from? Well, it comes from observations. Like you can go onto websites where they've been um, posting the data from those rain gauges. And remember I showed you yesterday, oh, Tuesday, uh, a map of where there's some rain gauges in the area here. Uh, most of those rain gauges have between 10 and 30 years worth of, worth of data. Some of them have data all the way back into the 50s, though. And so you take all the data that you get and um, the formula for calculating the return period, so you know, two year, five year, 10 year, that return period is calculated based on the number of years of data that you have, and then you're ranking a certain observation from highest to lowest. So let's say we have a spreadsheet table with uh, just year after year of data and it's all been recorded for the same duration. So you would order the data 
use this formula to calculate the return period, and then you do the same thing for other rainfall durations. And so just as an illustration of that and how we go through the process of interpolating, let's say that we had observations of rainfall. It looks like these are depths rather than intensity. So we have just <coughs> so far sorted from highest to smallest. And so at the top of the list is there was this observation where in five minutes there was 12.1, and that would be a lot of inches for five minutes. That might be millimeters. Uh, in the second place, 11. So to calculate the return period, what you'd say is if we had a total of 32 years worth of data that this came from, and so not shown is 4 through 32, um, all of the top storms for those years we ranked from largest to smallest. So the return period, what we've seen is during the 32 years, the number one storm that we had was this one where for a five minute duration was 12.1 millimeters. So what that means is that the return, per the return period for that particular storm is every 33 years. But the next one, we're doing n plus 1 divided by m. And since m is 2 for the second place storm, that means the return period of the second place storm of 11 millimeters is every 16.5 years. If we go back to the IDF table, there wasn't a curve that had 33 or 16.5. It's more uh, customary to express it in 2, 5, 10, 25, 50, and so on. So when you naturally have data that lines up to these weird return periods, you're going to have to interpolate to find out what's the 25-year storm. So you would use a linear interpolation to be able to say what's the 25-year storm depth. And so we would say, uh, you know, find the slope between 33 and 16.5, and likewise between 12.1 and 11.0, and just linearly interpolate. And so that's what this next step in the illustration is saying, that we've calculated the return period. So now we have to do it for all of the durations and linear interpolate. So we generate for the 20-year storm. If we wanted to know the 20-year storm, then we would go, it's somewhere between 11 and 12.1. And it's closer to, 16.5 is closer to 20 than 33 is. And so it's going to be just a little bit more than 11. So we go through the linear interpolation process. And um, we are going to be, in the homework, going to find some actual rain gauge data. And you're going to go through this process of downloading uh, a spreadsheet file, ordering it, calculating the return period, and interpolating. But you'll only be able to do it, if I remember correctly, for the 24-hour data. Because what we have from the data that's available is daily totals. It's actually pretty rare to have rainfall depth or intensity data for anything other than daily totals. I mean, at a handful of airports and some research stations, they might have it in 15-minute increments. But that's pretty specialized, uncommon data. So for the assignment, what we'll do is we won't have lots of different columns corresponding to different rainfall durations. But you will have lots of rows. Each one of the rows is going to refer to some storm incident that we actually observe. And then you're going to use that to calculate the return period. So I'll give you an illustration of basically how to uh, head down that road once we download some data from an actual station today in class. So there's a lot of different places online you can get good rainfall data um, besides just like WSAZ. Um, uh, PRISM is an interesting website that's operated by Oregon State. And they have done that with a, a grant from the um, Department of Agriculture. And the thing that's nice about PRISM is they look long-term data. Instead of focusing on, in, on individual storms, they're coming up with monthly totals, annual totals. And what's, I think, pretty interesting is um, annual averages. And so they have a variety of maps where you can look and see on a 30-year basis what's the annual precipitation average. So you can see here in West Virginia where we are, we're in the range of 
about, let's see, based on the color there, about 40 inches per year. In the mountains, they get more. Um, but of course, out in the west, it's typically more dry, and there are some spots in the west where they're seeing less than four inches per year of rain. The Gulf Coast gets a lot of precipitation, and the most is along the Pacific Northwest. So we all know it rains in Seattle, and here's the visual proof of that. Um, so that's just one illustration of the data that's available on uh, this PRISM website. I've used it in the past for um, the historical data. Like you can look up what was the annual average, what was the annual rainfall in a certain year. Like if you wanted to see what was the climate like in 1983. And that was a really wet year that caused a lot of flooding out in the western United States. So PRISM is kind of a top level view of the historical data. Precipitation frequency data server is something you're going to use a lot. Of, of all the tools I'm showing you today, it's probably the most uh, useful in terms of hydraulic design um, because what it allows you to do is pick a spot on the map and uh, it'll tell you an IDF table for it. And it's nice because it's already got all of the statistics done in the background. It's uh, validated. It's accepted. It's defensible. So that if, you know, in engineering, a lot of times the question is, why did you do that? Like, what are your assumptions? You know, if, if somebody doesn't like the result of your analysis, they're going to start throwing stones and questioning uh, the data that you used, questioning your methods. And this is as defensible as it gets. This is the gold standard of how much the rainfall is going to be in a certain area. So you can click on the map or choose a state. So if we click here on West Virginia, it zooms in on the map a bit. And up here at the top, we first of all can choose between whether we want to create a table that is depth or intensity. So we can have an intensity chart if we're going to be doing something like the rational method, Q equals CIA. And if we need an I, then we would choose to generate a table of intensities. But if we want to know like maybe pond volume sizing, and we maybe would want instead to know the depths, or if we're interested in things like uh, um, soil science or crops, those are applications that maybe depth would be more in important as well. Of course, you can switch between units. Now this time series data, this is a complicated distinction. There's partial duration and annual maximum. And annual maximum, the theory there, if we go back to the, uh, the example where we're saying, well, let's make our own IDF table, we have 32 years of data. There's two ways we could have sorted the data. One is for every year, we could have picked out the biggest storm for that particular year and then uh, ranked them once we picked out the biggest in every year. Or we could have picked the top 32 regardless of which year it was in. So some years are going to have like two really big storms. And if we were using the annual maximum approach, we would only see the biggest of those two storms. But the partial duration approach up here, partial duration is saying, uh, we're not going to limit ourselves to considering only the largest storm from any given year. Partial duration is the most common, but there are some cases where by code or by convention, they're using annual maximum instead. It doesn't have a huge effect on the, uh, uh, on the IDF table in most spots. OK, so let's just create one for intensity using English units and the more standard partial duration. What you can do is you can type in the latitude and longitude, or you can type in an address, and it will move the cursor to wherever you want it. Um, or you can just drag and drop the target. So let's see, where's the tri-state? I guess it's around here somewhere. We could zoom in a little more, find Huntington. All right, let's drop it right on Marshall. Okay, so 
what is the precipitation situation like here in Huntington? So below that now, it's created a table. We have each column represents the return periods, and each row is, is uh, representing the storm duration. So that's a little bit different. Sometimes the X and Y for the table is reversed. But what we could see is if our analysis told us that we need to find the runoff for a 10-year storm in Huntington, you know, we're sizing a catch basin for a parking lot and we know the area, the intensity for that storm. If we have calculated the time of concentration, you know, looked at the travel time across that parking lot, maybe it's 15 minutes. So we say 10-year storm, 15-minute duration, the intensity will be 4.31 inches per hour. So here at the top, it's told us the units, inches per hour. Now, there's also a range beneath that. And that range is related to the confidence interval. So 4.34 is in the middle of that range, but we're 90% confident that the actual 10-year return period, 15-minute storm duration intensity is between 3.95 and 4.71. So if you want to have 90% confidence that you used the right uh, intensity, then you'd, and you want to be conservative, then you'd use the, higher of, the highest of that range. You'd use 4.71. So by using 4.71, now there's only a 10% chance that actually the rainfall amount is higher than what you picked. And likewise here, this lower range here, if you wanted to see like what's the potential that you've oversized your network and it's actually excessively too much capacity in the pipe, use the lower of the range and see how is the pipe performing at the lower of the 90% confidence interval. And Outside of that, there's a 10% chance that the actual precipitation value isn't inside of that range. So uh, most of the time when you're doing analysis, you might run the numbers just at the low and the high end to see what's happening, but the middle value is what people usually concern themselves with. Uh, even in a research setting, sometimes will kind of people will roll their eyes if you do the analysis at at both ends of the confidence interval as well as just the, the given uh, intensity. So that is what it looks like if you do precipitation intensity. Here I'll show you for depth. If we do depth, I'm not sure if it automatically, yeah, it automatically updated. So how do we know that these are depths rather than intensities? Even if we didn't know what we clicked on at the top, just the numbers themselves tell you whether it's an intensity or a depth. So what's the, uh, what's the clue? Yeah, the units, inches, that's a pretty good clue. Uh, the other clue is look at duration. Okay, 5, 10, 15, 30. The amount is getting bigger as the duration increases. If it's an intensity, that number is going to be getting smaller. So let's switch back to intensity. Okay, so if it's intensity, four, three, two, one, it's getting smaller because as the storm duration gets longer, it can't keep up that same intensity for a really long time period. You can only have high intensity for a short period. So if you look at the data table and the number is getting smaller with increasing time, you're looking at intensity, or you can check the units. But in the case of depth, the amounts are getting bigger because although the intensity is going down, um, the cumulative depth is larger. Because you've got, in a 60-minute storm, you've got the 5-minute am amount. You've also got the 10-minute amount and so on. So you, you had a longer period for that rainfall to accumulate. Okay, so the uh, precipitation data frequency server is pretty nice. You can have it create a, uh, a graph, an IDF curve graph for you. Here's how it looks 
if we're doing it in terms of duration. Here's how it looks if we're doing it in terms of intensity. Now here, they've done it log on the uh, time axis and also on the amount axis. Um, I don't usually bother with their graphical. I would just create my own in Excel using the numbers. You can, you can copy those numbers over to Excel and paste them. Uh, looks like you can also get it in a table format where they'll serve you up the file. Let's see, it comes up in Excel. Yeah, all right, so there's our IDF table. Gives you the, uh, the latitude, the longitude, the elevation of the point that you clicked on. Now, how did it get this? Like, where did this data come from? Well, what they did was they looked at all of the rain gauge data in the area, and they extrapolated. They weighted with more emphasis on the stations that have a longer uh, history and less emphasis for those stations that have a short history. And then they looked at general trends as well. It's not just um, you know, if there were three gauges in the area, they don't just strictly rely on those three gauges in the area. They also know, based on your geography, what kind of typical rainfall patterns there exist. And I'll show you a map that uh, illustrates in the United States these different types of rainfall that we've got. Before we do that, though, let's look at this last source of data, the uh, National Climate Data Center. This is where you can actually download the data for an individual station. So in the homework, I'm going to ask you to go get the data for an individual station. And the way you do that is let's click first on Data Tools. And then, oh, what is it? Find a station or select a location? Uh, Find a station, then daily, daily summaries. Okay, so find a station. It's already set to daily summaries. Let's kind of zoom in a little bit on some spots that we maybe would be interested in and see where are the stations that we can choose from. All right. Um, which stations it shows is going to adjust based on the date range that you've selected. And so right now, we just have a single day worth of data. And so for some reason, when you do that, it doesn't show the Huntington or the Charleston airport. But I, I think it might take a couple of days before Huntington and Charleston airport data shows up, because that data is validated before it's posted, I think. But if we go back and say, well, we want some place that has data from, well, we're interested in 1976 until September 1st, okay, 1976. September 1st, 76, until September 1st, 2018, apply. So now we've got a date range. And actually, there's more stations now, now that we've gone back a couple of days. And uh, we want to make sure that that station has precipitation data available. So it'll filter that if we were asking for data that wasn't available, like evaporation data, that's pretty uncommon. There's only a handful of stations that are reporting that. So we won't filter it by that. But now, uh, if we click, there's the airport. So you click on the locations, and it tells you the name. And they have a serial number, the lat long. You know, we could find the Charleston airport. There's Charleston Yeager. So from 47 until 2018 with 100% coverage. They haven't missed a single day at that airport. They've had no equipment failures. Some of these stations, though, will only have 63% coverage. Now, this is pretty awesome. The data goes back in Hamlin to 1899. So they probably didn't have a tipping bucket in Hamlin back in 1899. It was some guy in overalls and a ruler, right? But uh, so let's just get the Huntington Airport. Um, we'll add it to the cart. And what you have to do is tell it your email address and it'll email you when it's ready to download because it takes a while for it to process that. We don't want a PDF. A PDF is just a picture of the data. We want the real data. So we'll take it as a CSV. That will allow us to download it in Excel. Um, so from 76 to 2018, we'll continue here, and it'll ask us which data fields we want. So we want the name, 
guess we could go for the lat long. These data flags, um, if there's missing data or if the equipment is screwy or if they have any other kind of note, then it will include certain flags. And there's a table of contents you can get from the NCDC that will tell you what those flags mean. But for a station like the airport, they've already quality checked and fixed any errors in the data. So I don't usually worry about the data flags. But let's do just have it include the precipitation. You can have a lot of other stuff, too. You can have it tell you the air temperature and uh, like if it was sunny and whatnot. And some of that stuff's kind of interesting, but it's just the precipitation we'll go for in this time. So we click Continue, and then it asks for the email address. And let's see how long it takes to, uh, to generate this. I've had some cases where the students had to wait a whole day to get the order. And it might have been that the servers were slowed down for some reason. Um, and sometimes it may be immediately available. So let's see. Uh, queued. The status is queued. So let's check again. Processing. Oh, I like the sound of that. Check again. It shouldn't take wrong. Shouldn't take long. A watch pot never boils. All right, one last time before we move on. Processing. Come on. It's not that big of an order. All right, I guess you get what you pay for. We'll come back to this in a minute. Um, so the data we're downloading is from the airport. Here's some data from the airport. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was running a rain gauge out in a watershed um, in Ona, which was about 20 miles from the airport. And what I did was I graphed the rain gauge in Ona compared to the rain gauge at the airport. So 20, mi 20 miles apart, you'd think, they're going to get about the same precipitation in both spots. And there definitely is a correlation. I mean, you can see that when there's a wet day at the airport, there's usually a wet day in Ona. And these graphs cross each other a couple of times. But then there's also some divergence. Um, towards the end especially, so we're looking at August and September, there was a lot more wet weather at the airport than there was in Ona. So the point that I am making here is something called spatial distribution. And that's just a funny word that says the amounts of things over space, like how much is there over here, how much is there over there. And so whenever you're doing a, uh, an analysis, um, it would potentially be a mistake to just take the rainfall data from the airport and say, the rainfall at the airport describes what you can expect to see in Milton. You know, like maybe over a 30-year average, probably they're pretty close. But on a given day, there could be substantial variation. Um, when we're gathering rainfall data, you'll notice that this rain gauge is placed in an open area out of the way of buildings or vegetation that could cause interception. Um, so those obstructions can uh, reduce the intensity of the rainfall. So usually the rain gauges are put out in an open area, and also they're off the ground a bit. This figure doesn't show that very well. But if the rain gauge is too close to the surface of the ground and it's raining really hard, sometimes the rain bounces from the ground back into the rain gauge. Um, splashes. So if there's a puddle on the ground, the splashes could get into the rain gauge in addition to the stuff that's coming straight into the rain gauge from above. So that in-splashing needs to be avoided. Uh, it's possible that there can be evaporation from the rain gauge before it's uh, measured, and especially if it's just a daily total, where somebody's going out to visually inspect at each day the same time. There could be evaporation if there was a rain shower in the morning and then a sunny afternoon, and then the person who's just a volunteer rain enthusiast checks at 7 PM. Uh, it could have rained more than they observed. And so the tipping bucket gets away from that problem. But there still can be instrument errors where the machines need to be calibrated. Um, scum can accumulate on the little cups that holds water. And so if you have a, a slime layer or some organic sediment that's inside of that little tipping bucket cup, uh, 
then that can reduce the volume that it holds, and then it would be tipping too often. Um, low intensity precipitation sometimes isn't enough to actually trigger any kind of tip, like it can evaporate before it is um, measured. And occult precipitation, honestly, I don't remember what that means. Occult, that means like satanic, right? But I don't think that's what that means in this case. We're going to have to consult uh, Google on this one. Occult precipitation, does it mean at night? The ability of vegetation to precipitate the small water droplets existing in fog. Okay. I guess, uh, I guess that means that you aren't going to have the same uh, mist isn't going to accumulate on a rain gauge necessarily in the same way that vegetation can draw it out of the air. So how much rainfall plants are getting isn't always the same as how much rainfall this metal container is receiving. Because uh, in the same way that plants can evapotranspirate, like they can exhale water vapor, they can also draw in water vapor. So we all learned something new today, occult precipitation. I reminded myself what that was. I'm sure at one point I knew it and forgot it. All right, so this is just a, a little representation that shows how you could calculate what is the average precipitation amount inside of a watershed. Remember yesterday, uh, Tuesday in class, what we did was using Google Earth, we turned on the terrain, which is kind of like a 3D elevation model that the image is draped over. And then by pivoting around, by changing our view of the terrain from kind of like an isometric 3D perspective, we were able to visualize where were the uh, the ridge lines. And so that's what this black line is meant to represent, is you've got some sort of a ridge line that's defined by high points in the topography, and this is our watershed of interest. What if we have a lot of different rain gauges inside and surrounding that watershed? So just a simple aerial average only takes into account the rain gauges that are inside of the uh, watershed and it ignores those on the outside. So we're going to look at different ways of calculating an average. This is the simplest of them, just they all have equal weight um, and, uh, and we are including the ones that are relatively close to the border. So that equal weighting, what it doesn't do is it doesn't give more emphasis to the ones that are on the inside rather than the outside. And so the Thiessen method is a way of assigning areas, um, contributing areas based on the rain gauge. And so what you would do is you would connect the dots between two different um, locations. And so let's say Foster and Hangtree. That's a pretty good illustration. This dashed line between Foster and Hangtree, and then you draw another boundary that's perpendicular to that line, halfway between them. So what we've done is we've created a boundary, and we're saying on the lower left-hand side, all of that area is going to receive the rainfall depth associated with that rain gauge foster. And then on the other side of the line, it's going to get the depth associated with hang tree. So we've only got one line. We have to go through all of these. You can see Big Creek and Wyatt. We've got the dividing line between them. And then we have to have a dividing line between Foster and Wyatt, halfway between them and perpendicular to that line. So we've got these series of boundaries. And those are basically associated uh, areas. And then in this table, what we have is for each area, what was the depth and what is the the area that that station is assigned to, and it's kind of like a weighted average instead of a simple average. This was just a simple average, 3.26, but when we take into account what's the actual, you know, this Wyatt, that's a lot of rainfall and a relatively large area that we're assigning it to. So that brings the average up quite a lot. And some of these rain gauges that didn't get very much depth, Emmettville, Crystal City, less than an inch, since they're not being counted anymore in this Thiessen method, the average is quite a bit higher. So Thiessen assigns areas 
based on just uh, dividing lines. Another approach is in the isohyoidal method. You're thinking more about what is the actual precipitation doing. You know, this, it's not realistic. You know, what this is saying is that on one side of the line, there was nine inches of rain. And on the other side of the line, there was one inch of rain. And so, you know, you step over the line, and it's pouring torrentially. But then you step back again, and it's just a light rain. I mean, that's not realistic. So this next isohyoidal method says um, there should be more gradual variations and gradations in the rainfall depth. And so we're trying to create like a series of contours by extrapolating between the known points so we say, you know, between this gauge where there's 1.04 and where there's 9.10, let's make the divisions more gradual instead of a distinct, discrete, all or nothing approach. So here we're saying, all right, here's the two inches, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's a contour. And you create those contours influenced by the known values. And there are computer programs that can extrapolate and can take them into account. Um, doing it by hand is really kind of an art to know like, like what path these contours should take and how far between, between them to, to put the contours. But once you have integrated and assigned, you know, you've got your three inch band. So you, what you would do is you'd say all of the area between three and four inches, I'm going to add up that area amount and multiply it by the average depth between them. So I'd use 3.5 inches as the assigned rainfall depth for whatever the area is between them. And you'd go through and come up with an average that way. So again, now we're back down to 3.31. So ironically, in this particular illustration, our first guess of just using the simple average was closer than the Thiessen method. But it's not always that way. It's, it's generally accepted that Thiessen is better than arithmetic mean, and the isohyoidal method is better than Thiessen. And there's a whole lot of other ideas that have been developed over the years, but those are some that I think uh, it's worth being aware of. Any questions about that? Let's see if my job is finished. Complete. All right, great. So now I download the data. Uh, let's go ahead and open it straight away. All right, so we've got the latitude, the longitude, and the date. These precipitation amounts, if I remember correctly, are in millimeters. No, they're in hundreds of millimeters. Mm, I better check on that, right? These might be inches. Documentation. Sometimes the data that I've got in the past has been millimeters. And if you wanted to get the actual inches, then you'd have to convert. I guess the best way to know whether it's inches or millimeters is let's sort from largest to smallest. And if it's like in a day four, then that's probably inches. Uh, if it's like 25 or 50 or 75, then that's millimeters. Um, OK, so I'll sort from largest to smallest. So remember, this is from 76 to 2018, largest to smallest. OK, these are inches. So what that means is that the, the most that we saw during the period of interest was 3.89 inches. Okay, so that's precipitation in inches per day. Ooh, what did I do? And if we wanted to create a, uh, none of this stuff's changing, so I'm just going to delete it. That's all extraneous. But what I will do is uh, insert this rank. So this is the number one storm. This is the number two storm, the number three storm, and so on. So then once you have this rank, 
what you can also calculate is the return period. And so remember, the formula for return period is the number of years of data that you've got. And uh, that's 42 years. You've got 42 years of data. Uh, so it's 42 plus 1 divided by our rank number. So 3.89, the return period of that storm is it comes around once every 43 years. But to have a 3.8 inch storm, that has a return period of 21.5 years. So if we want to know the 25 year storm, we would do a linear interpolation between these two values. All right. So that's how, that's one of the ways that intensity, duration, frequency uh, tables are generated. They'll also do some statistical massaging by looking at the data tables in adjacent locations, and they'll sometimes get just like an aberration where they know, oh, there happen to be two really big storms that are almost the same depth, you know, 3.89 and 3.8. That was maybe just kind of a statistical anomaly. And so then they make some adjustments. And that's uh, this precipitation data frequency server. Um, NOAA Atlas 14 is what it's based on. And that's, that's the name of a product that um, is that statistically validated for the entire country um, calculation of rainfall intensity. All right, so we've been talking about spatial distribution. And spatial distribution is just any kind of representation of how, uh, in this case, rainfall varies over space. So this is for the entire country. Here's the one that we saw before for Hawaii, that you know it's more rainy on the leeward side than on the windward side. Um, and in a watershed, there can be spatial distribution as well. Temporal distribution is saying, let's look at how the amounts vary over time. So this is a seasonal temporal distribution map. And what this shows is that there is a different pattern of when is the rainy season in Miami, for example, where the rainy season kind of peaks in October, compared to other locations like in Montana, the rainy season peaks in June. So the reason for that is the types of storms that occur. In the Midwest, the, the dominant storm type is going to be a convective storm, where the, uh, th there, it's flat, so there's no orography. Right? There aren't those physical obstacles that the moist clouds have to get up over, and that's what causes the rain. So we don't have that in the Midwest. So the reason why Chicago, Kansas City, you know, those afternoon thunderstorms, you've got to be on the lookout for. Your plane will be delayed if you fly through Chicago because of the afternoon thunderstorms. But then other spots, they have fronts that come together. So uh, temporal distribution is just looking at variation in times. And, you know, this next figure is the number of days per year that have thunderstorms. And along the coastal parts of the western United States, it's five days or less of thunderstorms. Thunderstorms are really uncommon because um, just the weather patterns or the physical geography isn't there to have a rapid lifting of the moisture. Now, they may have plenty of rain. This isn't just the days with rain. Because Seattle, if we had a graph of the number of days of rain, it would probably be like in the 300s or something. Thunderstorms is rapid elevation of that moist air. So what's lifting it really quickly, um, it's more common in the central part of the United States and down um, off the Gulf Coast. So temporal means time. Um, it's, it's people like extreme events at least, you know, in theory, they like examining extreme events. And what they've been talking about is that these storms that are approaching South Carolina and North Carolina may set new records for the amounts of rainfall that has ever been observed in those places. Um, this is a series of figures that looks at, all over the world, what's kind of like the record storm events that have been observed. So, for instance, 
What's the, the, the one hour storm, the most that has ever been seen for an hour storm? Well, there isn't one exactly for an hour, but they saw in Holt, Missouri, a 40 minute storm where they had 10 inches of rain in 40 minutes. That's, guys, that's a lot. That's really a lot of water. Like, the, you know how much it takes to uh, cause Fifth Avenue to flood? I mean, we're talking like two inches will do it on Fifth Avenue. Less than two inches will cause Fifth Avenue to just be a river. So you throw 10 inches in 40 minutes, it's bananas. That's really a lot of water. But, I mean, this is a logarithmic scale, so uh, I'm not sure where in India this is, but they've got a lot of these records. And if we look at how much rain did they have during a 30-day period, in the course of 30 days, like 300 inches of rain. So, like, what's the, in, in the United States, the wettest part of the country is, like, along the Gulf Coast, down in Houston or Miami. And, uh, oh, I guess that's not true. Hawaii, like, the mountains of Hawaii probably has more. But, like, in the continental 48, like, it's really wet if you're getting 50 inches per year. And these guys saw in a month 300 inches per year. So that's, that's plenty of rain. It'll be interesting to see where on this scale uh, mac prob uh, maximum precipitation, like the 40 inches that they say they're going to get down on the coast of South Carolina. So if that's 40 inches in a day, a single day, that's about right. Uh, Smithport, Pennsylvania. In six hours, they saw 30 inches. So, and I'm, I'm surprised to see that because uh, Texas makes sense because you'd think it's maybe a hurricane. But then here's one for West Virginia, Rockport. Anybody know where that is? I've never heard of it. All right, the interesting thing is that it follows a, a linear scale. That, you know, there's more or less a slope to this line that can be reproduced. You can find the, uh, the rainfall depth in millimeters by 425 times d, where d is the duration in hours, to the 0.47 scale, uh, 0.47 power. Um, this has all been from observation. Sometimes they'll even take it a step further and they will extrapolate based on the capacity of air to hold water and what range of elevations you're likely to see holding on to water that could precipitate. And so sometimes, like in a dam break simulation, they'll consider what if the dam was full and we saw the probable maximum precipitation for this area, meaning you've got all these storms colliding and physically the absolute most water that could fall out of the sky because the, uh, the consequences of a dam failure are so extreme that they have to consider the worst case scenario. You know, like not, we're not talking about two year storm or 100 year storm, they're talking about like the 10,000 year storm in the analysis of dam performance. And so part of that analysis is looking at the probable maximum precipitation. And here are some tables. There's a publication, HMR 41, and I'm sure it's been revised since 1960, that, but this is a figure that's in your textbook that's showing for a certain watershed area what you could expect the rainfall amounts to be um, based on how long the storm was. And so, for instance, if you have a relatively small watershed and a six-hour storm, for a 10 mile square uh, watershed, over that average of the 10 miles, you may see 24 inches of rain in six hours as a probable maximum in the United States. Why do you suppose if you're talking about a larger area, so instead of 10 miles, 1,000 square miles, why is the amount lower? That's right. Just think about the odds. The odds are that if you have a lot of rainfall, that it's just in one spot you're seeing that concentrated intensity. It's less common to have really intense, heavy rainfall over a big area. So, you know, there may have been that center cell that was dumping loads and loads of water, but it was probably moving around. And so if we're talking about a thousand square miles, probably only part of that watershed had the really intense stuff, but then the rest of it had lower intensity, and so the average over the thousand was a lower amount. 
So that's the trend that I want to show you. First of all, that you know, the duration, as the duration increases, we're not doubling the amount. If you go from 6 to 12, for a 10 square mile watershed, we go from 24 to 29. So we're not doubling it, and it's for the same reason. You know, you can only have really high intensity for a short period. And so by doubling the duration, the intensity went down, although the absolute amount is marginally greater. So those are the general trends that you should be able to discuss, you know, the concepts here, is that as the area that we're considering increases, like the entire Mississippi River Basin, you're not going to have a storm that's raining on the entire, like, 38 states of the Mississippi River Basin all at once. It's only part of that watershed that's receiving rainfall at any given time. And so if you're considering a 10,000 square mile area, then maybe the maximum you could expect to see over that entire area would be 1.7 inches of rain in a six hour period. So those are the general trends associated with maximum uh, precipitation. Um, This is a, uh, a graph that kind of shows just a statistical technique that can be used to generate your own data. You know, this table is for just a discrete number of hours and a discrete number of uh, a, a watershed area. Um, this function, which is in your text, shows you how you could find out um, as the watershed gets bigger how the, uh, the percent of rainfall, maximum rainfall you'd see at a single point is uh, averaged out to that larger area. And uh, as the shorter duration it is, then you may have more variation between a single point and the entire area than if you have a long duration storm, there's going to be less variation between a point and the entire area. We won't go through the calculations of this. Um, it, it's not unimportant, but it's really the trend, the trends that, that we've already talked about that's at the heart of it. But this is important, and this will come back several times through the semester, especially when we're doing watershed modeling using uh, WMS. Man, it's just getting colder and colder in here, isn't it? Boy, oh boy. I feel like I'm at Ski Dubai. That's the uh, indoor ski resort, you know? Here, I'll cool it off. It's cooler. All right. Um, different regions have different kind of temporal distributions. So along the coast, they don't have very many thunderstorms there. The, along the coast, it's that kind of like slow, gradual storm that happens all day as a drizzle. So here you see on this graph, type 1 and type 1A are the least steep of all of them. Type 2 is the most steep, and like the slope of the line is a representation of intensity. So this graph is saying, with time on the horizontal axis and the percent of a 24-hour storm on the vertical axis, at the end of a 24-hour cycle, you've had 100% of the rain. But really, the key thing is, you don't assume that it's all coming in an even amount during that 24-hour period. You're going to have a little bit of rainfall at first, but then the typical pattern uh, is that the rainfall will increase during some middle portion of the storm. There will be a, a, a really high intensity, and then it'll taper off again. So we have type 2. All of West Virginia experiences type 2 typical behavior of uh, the, the most intense rainfall uh, compared to these more coastal areas. And, Type 3 is where it's influenced by hurricanes and um, like storms from out at sea. And we don't really have those in West Virginia, but I mean, these are all basically the places they get hurricanes occasionally. Um, so there is uh, this figure that shows these values. And we also have, uh, when we get into watershed modeling, uh, it's been digitized. And so if we say there is a, a three inch storm, that happens during 24 hours, this figure would tell us how much intensity there is during that 24-hour storm. So you could take a depth and then 
plug it into this, and it will tell you the intensity at all times during the duration. So here's that, that figure where if you knew the rainfall amount, then you could multiply it by the fraction, and that would tell you how much of the depth has occurred up to a given time. And it varies by type. And what you need to remember is that we are type 2 here in West Virginia. Um, <clears throat> this is taken from your textbook. This Hydro 35 was the precursor to NOAA Atlas 14. So the NOAA Atlas 14 is a precipitation data frequency server where we were clicking at a location and it told us the IDF curve. The reason they were able to do that is that uh, in the years pre prior to it, they generated these actual physical maps where um, this map is how much depth you can expect to see for a two-year, 60-minute uh, duration storm. And so if you click on the spot, well, you don't click, you look with your finger and you find the contour line. It looks like uh, this is the 1.4-inch contour. And here's the 1.2. So we'd be 1.25 inches here in the tri-state. 1.25 inches is the two-year, 60-minute precipitation depth. And then you'd look up another paper map that would show you the 100-year, 60-minute. And then what you'd do is you would yourself interpolate between the 2 and the 100 to find other return periods. And um, so here's the, the formulas. They're also in your textbook that says if you have, for instance, the 5-minute storm duration and you have the 15-minute storm duration, you could calculate the 10 by just doing kind of a weighted average between them. And the same thing, you will be given the 15 and the 60 to find the 35 with this weighted average. And then there's another way of interpolating for uh, return periods. And so these were duration interpolations. But you also interpolate by knowing the two-year storm and the hundred-year storm, which you look up off of the map, you would find, you know, if they're asking you about Chicago, you'd have to know where Chicago is. It's right there. There's Chicago. So you'd look it up. You'd say, I, I know what the two-year is. I know what the hundred-year is. And then I'm going to use this formula and the value coefficients for A and B to interpolate and tell me the 5, 10, 25, 50. And the reason why we're able to do that is that across the country, there's roughly the same pattern in what an IDF table looks like. I mean, if you know the green line, which is the two-year storm, oh, I guess the yellow line is the two-year storm. If you know the two-year storm, and you know the 100-year storm, then the rest of them are just kind of like in between at a pretty regular interval. And that's what this formula does, is it's just saying, once you know the 2 and the 100, there isn't that much irregularity that can't pretty be predicted with just this weighted average. So I think you may have a question on this homework that's due a week from today, where you have to plug numbers into this formula and into this one based on values you got from the paper map, which is in your book. Any questions so far? So we're, we're talking about rainfall. And sometimes it is confusing to, uh, to make the jump between rainfall depth and rainfall volume. So when they talk about how there may be up to 40 inches of rain uh, that's going to happen on some parts of the coast of North and South Carolina, so let's say 40 inches. So that's just one dimension. How do we turn it from 40 inches of rain into cubic feet? Well, that's where you're looking at the area that it fell over. So here, the rainfall amount can either be expressed in terms of a length or in terms of a volume. And the difference is you'd have to multiply by the area. Uh, rainfall intensity and rainfall amount likewise have different units. The rate or intensity is going to be length per time, whereas the rainfall amount is most typically just described as the depth that was encountered. And sometimes that will be that they put a ruler into a container and they actually measured the depth. But usually, more, more often, it's going to be the tipping bucket 
that they're using as a uh, way of measuring the rainfall. A lot of the IDF tables we've seen so far today have shown return period, which is also called recurrence interval. And that is a statistical average of how much time is between storms of that duration. And what sometimes throws people off is when you can say, oh, we had a 100-year storm. It doesn't mean it's going to be 100 years until the next time you see a 100-year storm. It might be 200 years, or it might be six months before you have another 100-year storm. It would maybe be a little bit more accurate if we referred to those storms in terms of their probability. And so a 100-year storm in any given year has an average probability of 1%. But some people are really lucky, and some people are really unlucky. So you can have improbable events happen in sequence, uh, and that's what's sometimes hard to keep in mind. So I told you it's pretty rare to have stations with really high resolution, like 15-minute data. Um, this is a map that shows for when they were making the NOAA Atlas 14, that precipitation data frequency server. These are the stations that went into that, because these are the stations where they had a relatively large amount of data available. And the, the graph that's in the lower right shows how much time is in that data. So how many of the stations had how, how many years of data? You know, there were probably, there's only one station, I think, that has 110 years worth of data. There were 10 stations that had 100 years worth of data. But something happened 60 years ago where it looks like they added a lot more stations more frequently back then. And so uh, this is for daily. This is the daily data, where they just have the 24-hour totals. It seems like a lot until you're interested in a location that's kind of remote in between, in between spots. Here is the, uh, here's the stations where they have data that's available either on an hourly basis or anything more frequently than hourly basis. And so now, this is really thinning out the herd. In, in each state in West Virginia, there's maybe 15 stations where hourly data is available, in most cases at airports. All right, so is this rainfall on depth? or rainfall intensity that we're looking at? Depth. Depth, that's right. Because if it was intensity, you'd have the most for the short duration. So this is amount. So if we have increasing duration and increasing amount, then that tells us that it's amount rather than intensity. All right, so just uh, to emphasize on spatial distribution, the relationship between spatial distribution and geography. Like for West Virginia specifically, why is there more rain on the east side of the state than where we live in the west part of the state? Mountains, altitude, orography. Exactly right. And I remember um, I went to Richwood a couple of years ago for the first time. It was in October. And uh, I guess that's right about here, like in the Cranberry Wilderness area. I was blown away at how different it is there. Like the types of plants that you see, totally different from, I mean, it makes, it makes Cabell County look like a barren desert. Like I felt like I was back in Nevada when I drove home uh, after having spent time like walking through ferns. It was like a rainforest, literally like a rainforest. It was the forest and it was raining and it's a, high rainfall area is 60 inches of year uh, compared to like in the 30s. So it's really beautiful out there. If you've never been out to uh, like Richwood and uh, Cranberry area, I really encourage you to check it out sometime. 